Uncle Sam wants to regulate your electric bicycles, but it's not too late. There is time for public comment, and we're going to take a deep dive and find out what's really going on. Now, this isn't a shooting gallery. I'm actually going to consider all the words and intentions that are put in place. So the start of this is that the Consumer Product Safety Commission is considering developing a rule to address the risk associated with electric bicycles or e-bikes. Now, if I understand this correctly, they are trying to set rules for the manufacturers to implement, which of course is going to go back to the consumers. So this isn't actually trying to set a rule on what you can do that I know of, but all of this is gonna come back to us in the end anyway. So right now they are doing some preliminary information gathering and there are 52 prompts and questions for comments. Some of them are repeats under a different headings. So don't be surprised if we skip around a bit. And if you wanna hear another expert opinion, stick around because I'm not the only one who's weighing in. And be sure to let me know what you think because I'm going to be responding to every comment in this video for the next little while. On top of that, there is a chance that the legislators at the CPSC are going to be reading comments on videos just like this. So let's go ahead and start with number four. I'll put it up on screen. It asks which bike should be considered for rulemaking and why? Well, I would classify electric bikes differently than what's already on the books, but we have to stick to that standard. So I'm gonna say that low speed e-bikes, which are under 750 watts and all that stuff, I think those are fair game for consideration along with the non-existent category of high speed electric bikes. So right now the commission is not regulating or establishing rules for high-speed e-bikes, but they have expressed that they have the authority to do so. Now, I really want to say in no uncertain terms, get your hands off my e-bike, Uncle Sam, and that there should be no rules made. However, I am of the opinion that the rules are going to be coming, and it is our responsibility as community members to guide and shape the discussion towards something that's more reasonable. Now, if we do nothing about it, then a hungry lawyer or a grandstanding politician is gonna set out to slay the dragon of evil e-bikes in the future. And if no standards exist, they're going to make some at that time when emotions and social noise are very, very high. As we grieve this terrible loss, I have called for an emergency council meeting where I will be proposing an emergency ban on e-bikes and scooters effective immediately. On the other hand, if that scenario goes forward and that politician is met with rules that already exist that we make right now, it would be very hard to maintain the momentum of outcry if they have to actually look at existing rules and try to adapt or modify them. But you know what? I'm starting to think that this entire thing is hinging upon one assumption. I'll get to that later because it's actually kind of fun to go through them. So number 11 and 12 actually hits home for me because it asks about the increased risk for heavier electric bikes. Now I am of the opinion that e-bikes should have really good brakes. Now the trend is already starting to come in naturally. I'm not the only person who thinks this and I'm really happy. I still cringe when I see mechanical disc brakes on heavy electric bikes and I worry that most consumers have no idea what to look for and why. And honestly, I wonder if a manufacturer rule should be in this place because the times when a customer realizes that their brakes are insufficient is usually when it's too late, on top of a mountain or going too fast in traffic. Now the existing standards for bicycle brakes were made back when anything over 50 pounds of a bike was totally insane. And the only person who could get over 28 miles an hour was Greg LeMond. By the way, Greg's got his own electric bikes now, so don't go thinking that electric bikes are for cheaters because clearly they are not. Now, I think it is a good idea to consider upgrading the standards for brake components to keep up with the technology. So I think that's one that we should think about. Okay, number 14 is actually pretty funny to me because it talks about the risks of three-wheeled bicycles, of which the, <laughs> it's absolutely minimal risk. The big reason is that the primary market for three-wheeled electric bikes are folks who are doing rehabilitation, have balance concerns, and of course, the many aging clientele. Now, three-wheeled e-bikes are usually driven softer than grandma's Oldsmobile, so I think it's a waste of time to put rules on these because realistically, they're never going to be challenged. Okay, number 19 sticks out like a sore thumb. Quote, do consumers use off-road e-bikes capable of speeds over 28 miles an hour on the road? So the answer to this one is yes, absolutely it happens, and it happens quite a bit. But does this mean that the behavior by itself is dangerous? And I don't think so, because I believe that high speed on an electric bike is an active choice by the user and not a surprise risk, such as the brakes that I mentioned earlier. General consumers very much understand the risk of high speed and they engage with that risk every single day when they drive a car. 
Even bikes showcased on channels that I consider extreme, I wind up seeing them approach risk with some semblance of judgment. I mean, check this out. This guy waited until he was on a clear and open space with no other cars around before blasting his bike up to high speed, and then only briefly for a moment. On top of that, he's even using the buddy system. And wouldn't you know it, you can never catch this guy without a helmet. So now I'm not giving the guy a pass for everything he does, and of course I have seen videos of users making electric bikes do dangerous things, but then again, I've seen the same thing for chopsticks. And simply because an outlandish scenario exists, it doesn't mean that it's common. We have to remember that. Because this day and age, the nonsense rises to the top of social media, and therefore the top of public consciousness. Each of us has to be aware that we have been affected by years of social media use in which our brains have been programmed to seek for wild emotions. Now, none of us are so righteous that we can claim that our logic has not been affected by this chronically conditioned outrage. So if you want to start making rules for e-bikes, I don't think it's wise to start with the absolute worst possibility that could be out there. You know, I'm starting to think that this is kind of a red herring because the real question is actually hidden in the middle. I'm going to get to that because I've identified it as number 32. So number 24 asks about conspicuity. How do you say that? Conspicuity? Conspicuousness? I mean, it's basically visibility. So more or less, it's asking if electric bikes should have different rules for how visible they are. That's a really good question, but really almost all of the electric bikes that I have tested include a set of lights. Some of them are actually pretty advanced and other times are kind of simple. Now, since e-bikes travel faster and therefore give a car less time to react to their presence, I'm actually a little hesitant to say that there should be a rule made on this behalf. On the other hand, if every single electric bike had mandatory lights or extra reflectors, then cars would notice them and therefore notice how prolific they have become and perhaps in the back of their mind, they would want to look for that. But I don't know. It's really another question for theoreticals. But I don't see number 25 on their prompts being all that effective, but I still want to see it done. It asks if there should be extra instructions, markings, or labels on electric bikes or packaging. I really don't think this will have an impact on the data that's been compiled on risk, but it is incredibly inexpensive to implement, and it would make people feel good for having done something. So. Yeah, go ahead, make a copy-paste section in the user's manual that already exists, and then boom, done, next crisis. Okay, number 26 actually asks about acceleration limits, which basically leans into wattage restrictions on motors in a not too roundabout way. Now, regulators and consumers are already looking for an easy way to classify and understand electric bikes, and the motor wattage is a simple number that's often used for that purpose. The issue is that limiting output also disproportionately limits riders of a certain body type. So I'll put it to you this way. A stereotypical furniture mover is not going to get the same acceleration as a stereotypical web content strategist. And this bleeds into a big problem, which is restrictions that are far too broad. Because there's a lot of electric bike riders who use them for rehabilitation from a serious disease or an accident. And wouldn't you know it, these are often accompanied by weight gain. So if the electric bike is not strong enough to initiate momentum, then it would be useless in this case. And this is actually only one ugly example because adaptive cycling is a life-changing opportunity for many riders. And in many cases, these are heavy three-wheeled electric bikes with a lot of extra metal and componentry. Now, I wouldn't want a broad painting rule that effectively prohibits these bicycles being made. Many of these riders cannot make a bike like this on their own, and banning businesses from making them, ordering them, or even making another hidden goose chase of certification or fabrication devices for disabled bikes or whatever, that's the fastest way to condemn these poor people to the brain-numbing blue glow of the television set. I mean, seriously, I get passionate about this. Check this out. This woman, Rhonda Martin, she lost 277 pounds and completely transformed her life. Instead of the grind of weight loss programs, she found electric cycling. And she said, quote, it wasn't something I dreaded. It wasn't a chore. It was just enjoyment for me. Now, this is only possible because she had a powerful enough electric bike that could carry her around. And I'm very certain that it had to undergo very routine maintenance. But other bikes can be made in the future for other applications. And if you want these people to just not have that opportunity, then a wattage restriction or an acceleration restriction would definitely do that. Okay, number 27. 
Number 28 is preposterous. It asks if there should be rules on tire size. Absolutely not. Innovations in tire size have greatly increased the utility of bicycles in general. No, absolutely not. This would be the worst thing to happen to bikes since the Yike bike. Better hold on, buddy. And if I see something I think is just damn stupid, I say it. And I think that bike is just damn stupid. I can't see any point in it. Number 30 and 31 ask about kids' electric balance bikes, which is actually a new category of electric bikes that's only been around for a few years. These are not used by teenagers, but instead little kids, usually at a park. My daughter has been testing and enjoying these for about four years, and they are an amazing tool for confidence, exploration, endurance, and... Also something else, so my daughter has actually crashed on these bikes many times. She's ran into trees, park benches, other kids, and the worst one was a handicap rail. But each of these crashes is a priceless lesson in risk. I would much rather she learn on a bicycle instead of later on when she's driving a car. These bikes are not strong by a long shot. Parents buy them for the children who have no way of altering them. And yeah, I think it's a good thing. Don't tamper with it. Number 32 is the real question that we're all asking, should e-bikes have speed governors? Now this is again predicated on a yet to be established complete categorization for all electric bikes. So balance bikes, of course I say no because these machines are already at an acceptable level and bike companies will never survive trying to make a high speed version for babies. Moving on, low speed electric bikes as they are currently defined, which is the vast majority of the market right now, they already have a top speed established. Electric bike companies ship their bikes as class one, two, or three, and they have governors built into the software of the bike. Now people do hack or change the system to get to a higher speed, but the CPSC should not be trying to set rules for the misuse of a product. So now we get to the headline of the issue. Should there be a speed governor on the yet undefined high speed electric bike classification? I say no. I can already hear somebody in the comment section typing in, nobody needs to go that fast. The classic libertarian would ask if you want the federal government to be deciding what you need or don't need. But really in more everyday terms, when people drive around in their cars, the car doesn't have a speed limit, but the road does. Now, despite constant misuse, the government does not decide the acceptable speed maximums when setting one of these seemingly limitless rules for manufacturing a car. Cars weigh in at about 3,000 pounds and can destroy a house. So why should an electric bicycle be subject to greater scrutiny than a car? So let me ask you this. Do you think there should be a federal regulation on governing the speed of cars? Let me know in the comments section. I'd love to hear. Your logic. Number 34 is actually pretty important. I'm glad they put it in. It asks what technologies exist to protect electric bike riders. And there are a few. It turns out that the market is already being catered to and has for some time. On the low end of the spectrum, companies like x -Nitto, they make an electric bike specific helmet to withstand high speed crashes. Well, high speed meaning over 15 miles an hour up to 28. E-bike rated tires have been around for a long time, which is a major safety component, but I don't hear a whole lot of talk about that. And then on the high end, you've got anti-lock brakes that are available for bicycles. I tested them out about five years ago, and they're amazing for new riders. For the experienced riders, it really doesn't change a whole lot, but these technologies already have been in the marketplace, and I mean, Bosch even makes an anti-lock brake system, so there has to be some sort of money in it. But also consider this, whenever a video comes out on social media of somebody racing around too fast on an electric bike, a company that makes safety equipment gets a boost in sales. I've got one more vitally important thing that I want to address about all of this, but real quick, Area 13 Electric Bikes, it's a California-based store and active YouTube channel. They've got some opinions on the matter, and I have a link to their channel on screen, or it's below the like button. Okay, I've saved the best for last. I believe that this entire Consumer Product Safety Commission proposal of rulemaking e-bikes is based on nothing. So yeah, the impetus for this proposal assumes that electric bikes carry with them a risk to the consumer. They start by noting injuries reported from micromobility, which over the course of five years, they say increased by 3,538. I really don't see this as a bad thing myself because when people ride electric bikes, they interact with the world. They go to work, explore their communities, make friends, and uplift the world around them. People choose to take the risk of getting away from the anxiety-inducing pacifier that is our modern hyper-consumer society. Every single one of these injuries represents not one, but thousands of people who got an electric bike around the same time and are out there right now experiencing the splendor of crisp air filling their lungs, 
the pains of muscles strained from achieving their new goals, and the wonder of an exciting world around them. Honestly, if I got in a terrible bike wreck, which is very possible, I would have deep, heaving tears of remorse if that caused others to miss out on the joy that I have experienced. So the last little bit is that this chart uses a graph and they showcase increasing electric bike deaths each year, capping out at 100 over the five year span, which it kind of sounds like they were trying to get to a round number there. So in the USA, that number climbed to 41 deaths on electric bikes for the year of 2022. Now, electric bikes are more popular every year, so it does stand a reason that any product, I mean, Coca-Cola for heaven's sakes, it would cause more death only because more people are using it, right? I'm not trying to minimize the loss for these people or their families, but I have to ask if electric bikes are the place that we should be putting our attention. Now, I'm not a statistician. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. I think that electric bikes are a net positive. E-bikes get more people out and exercising, introducing them to new places, people, hobbies. It reduces depression, dependence, and it improves a rider's health. I think that we all need to be very cautious how we approach setting limits on electric bikes because it's a life-changing technology that will continue into the future so long as we don't take it for granted. I wanna hear from you guys. Again, I'm gonna be reading all the comments for the first while, so leave them below. You can support the channel on Patreon or check out this video on a recent lawsuit with Rad Power e-bikes.